opportunity for you to see me opening my little pots of paint. <laughs> These are all acrylics with uh, medium in them. They're about 60, 70, 80 percent medium and the other percentage uh, paint. So more medium than paint. Did you get it? That's so they're transparent. Are we going anywhere yet? Looks like we are. Whoops. But my monitor's not working, so forgive me just a minute. I'm going to restart my uh, iPad. Sorry for the back of my head. I'll be with you in just a minute. I'll worry about that later. Hello friends, my name is Dan. I'm on the street again. <laughs> on the road again. And this is Daily Art Adventure number 666. 666. There's something about that number. Anyway, <laughs> that means I've done this 666 times since January 1st of 2017. That's quite a few times. And uh, sure, let me pick you up for a minute and show you the scene that I'm witnessing. So the lighting right now is terrible, but I'm thinking of a composition, something like that, but with sun, setting sun, uh, coming in from the left. At the moment, we have a storm front. Well, in fact, I was all set up here this evening, about an hour ago. I was all set up, and the weather was so threatening that I took all my electronics, put them back in my van. This is my van right here. And uh, sat for a while and then looked at the radars again. And it seems like it's a reasonable risk. Um, now, since I'm doing mechanics, um, a couple of you have asked, well, don't your paints dry out? And the answer is, of course they do. Well, they don't dry out in pots as, as fast as you would think because they're contained, you know? But I have this little tiny spray bottle that goes in my easel kit right here. And I will do that periodically throughout the evening. All right, so let's pick up a couple of big brushes, get them wet, and let's get going. So. bluish up here, grayish, blue-gray sky. So that means red stuff here. There's a lot of, actually red and green over here. So that, that I, I have no idea what to color <laughs> to do. So I'll just start by doing the easy part. I love this part. This is where there's a, there's a few people hanging up here. Not exactly watching me, but I'm right in front of them, so they can't help but watch me very much. And at this m minute they're saying, "Well, golly, I thought he was going to I thought he was going to be a good painter." <laughs> Turns out he's one of them modern artists. <laughs> and I don't care how much you like abstract paintings, which I do. <laughs> when you see an artist on the street, <laughs> you want to see him paint something, dog on it. <laughs> you don't want to see him <laughs> do an abstract painting. So all my friends, all my audience just left in bitter disappointment. <laughs> All right, I like that. That's good enough. Now let's do some uh, water, water soluble pastels. Who ever heard of such a thing? I'm still not exactly sure what that means. 
I'm assuming, <laughs> since the Charvans are responsible people, I'm assuming that means there's some, some kind of difference between um, these and, and ordinary pastels. <laughs> But how would you know? <laughs> how would you tell the difference? I'm not really sure. Because <laughs> if you take ordinary pastels and get them wet, they're wet pastels. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, I like them. I like the effect. They're, they're, they're quite um, gentle. Um, that is to say, as soon as I put water on these lines, much of what I'm doing will disappear. But hopefully not not all. So, all right. Enough of that for the moment. I might come back and use those again later. I hope that I will. Let's use some slightly smaller brushes. Whoops! And I'm just about out of white acrylic. Whoops! That would be a bad a bad thing to have happen. I hope. I usually, I'm supposed to have a backup of everything in my van here. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I have backup white. If I don't, I will be leaving, we will be leaving the acrylic stage rather early. Yeah, as you can see, my, my abstracts tend to be straight lines and curves, shoots and ladders, maybe. Can I take a picture? Certainly, certainly. Can I take a picture? Absolutely. Post it everywhere. <laughs> and, in, and in case you want you want to go home and say, who was that guy? <laughs> Thanks. All right, now I'm gonna do some drawing. Love these long handled brushes. And let's just try to start roughly roughing in. How's that for a redundancy? Roughly roughing in the scene. So that's the side of a building. There's the top of the hill over there. Far away building. Yeah, thank you. I have no idea, of course. You hear this all the time if you follow me. I have no idea whether these lines are in the right place. I'm taking my best guess, but my best guess will little by little be corrected as I proceed throughout the evening. Usually, most of the time. Most of the time, at some point or several points, I'll have I'll have a good grief. What was I thinking? Kind of moment. That sound familiar? If you're an artist, trees. There's a lot of stuff in this scene. Now you better decide. Hey man, it's looking good. Thank you. 
I better decide where this image is going. I'm using blue uh, mostly because um, it's a nice contrast with the abstract marks that I put down. So even, even the blue lines are, are an abstract choice. I'm not, I'm not doing blue because um, the subject matter is blue. Not at all. So I, I'm already moving these buildings over quite a bit. Over and in, over, moving them over, moving to them, let me say that again, moving them to the left over an inch. So that's a pretty big adjustment. And some of you will say, well, what are you going to do with the mistakes? Right? The earlier lines that I put down that I'm now am determining or have determined that they were in the wrong place. And the answer, as you regulars know, the answer is, what am I gonna do with them? The answer is nothing. Now, so once in a while, sometimes I do have to sort of erase, so to speak, but it's not, not f for the reason that, that many of you would, you, let, me, let me try to get into the head of the student painter for a minute. Let me try to get in y'all's heads. Um, and, and I know this is true because you're human, but I'm trying to get you over. <laughs> I'm trying to get you past it. <laughs> no, past being human. Um, when you make a mistake, there's some kind of, sometimes, so way too often, shame, embarrassment, uh, discouragement, all those kinds of negative feelings come, shall we say, flooding over your soul. And um, so you're tempted to cover up your erstwhile mistakes. <laughs> Sometimes I just like using old-fashioned old words. <laughs> so you're tempted to cover up your, your earlier mistakes because they're, they're kind of a shame to you. You feel embarrassed about them. Now, not, maybe not all of you, but yeah, that's kind of, that's, yeah, most of you. <laughs> and, and so you're tempted to, um, as I say, cover up. And, and that's a, a, not a positive, that is not a good impulse. That is not, not a good way to live life. Um, just, let the mistakes hang out there because they will create um, um, an interesting texture, pattern, chaos in the late stages of the painting. All right, I've, I have talked on that so many times, I don't want to talk about that anymore, so. The bottom line being, Go ahead and whack something down. <laughs> just, just draw something. But don't, but don't um, put your weight down, so to speak. Don't pretend that what you put down in the early stages of the painting was was correct. Right? Oh man, I've got some kind of big mistake going on here, and I'm not sure what it is. Wow. Okay, let's, let's see if we can, okay, first of all, this goes much higher. Okay, so see, there's another mistake, right? Can you see that high? Yeah. I thought it was there, then it's like, oh no, it's more like there. And, and so forth and so on and so on and so forth. Got it?
Huh. I'm gonna <laughs> believe it or not, I'm going to move these buildings over again. Wow. And again, as I like to say, witness my distress. <laughs> In other words, no distress. I'm not gonna let it bother me. I'm not gonna feel embarrassed or ashamed. I'm just gonna but look at the first time I drew this building, it was over here, then I moved it here, now I've moved it here. Because as I compared, you know, com compared as the drawing became more complete, and I started com comparing shape to shape, I came to realize that my shapes were not in the right place. So there you go. And all of these mistakes, quote unquote mistakes, just create an interesting texture. Uh, one of the chief objectives in the whole underpainting stage, like especially in my case, which is the underpainting is in acrylics, one of my primary objectives is to create sufficient, adequate chaos One of my goals is to create enough mess that so that in the late stages of the painting process, especially the final edit layer, I have lots to respond to so that in the final edit layer, I don't, I'm not, so to speak, making stuff up out of whole cloth. Do you know that expression? It's so that I don't have to be filling up large swaths of, of the canvas of the painting uh, in the later stages. There, there'll be lots of texture for me to respond to. Now, let me see if I can figure out. Yeah, the vanishing point be good if I could figure that out. Uh, let me go back to the issue of um, erasing stuff just for a minute. Uh, I said generally speaking I don't bother erasing and I never erase out of that sense of shame and embarrassment that I, that I was talking about earlier. Never, never. Um, I do however sometimes erase so to speak like cover up something with white, opaque white. Um, because if I don't, in a, in a very, like this subject matter, in a very, very busy subject matter like this, it can be hard to tell where I am, like which line is correct. Now, so far I'm okay. Um, but sometimes, sometimes things get so complicated that it just is is wise, just good business. Just go ahead and um, erase, so to speak. Again, but not out of that, not out of that horrible. Oh, I'm so embarrassed, kind of stuff. No, just because um, if I don't erase, that I'm afraid when I come back on my next layer, I won't be able to figure out which line is right and which one is wrong. Does that make sense? Oh, and I'm going to do something here. I said a while ago that I, I wasn't uh, drawing anything. Um, with local color, but now I am. There are a row of red umbrellas. And the reason for going with local color, realistic color, is for the very reason I just said, so that I can, when I come back later with it in just a glance, I'll be able to tell that uh, those are umbrellas. That makes sense?
Okay, it really does help to have a, a physical uh, vanishing point painted on on the canvas. That's that dot, that white dot right there. So now, now, having said that, however, let me tell you that the buildings in this scene. Yeah, I'll sh let me show you the scene again because I'm, I'm sure some of you have joined us in the last several minutes and you missed me. let me show it to you again okay hang on earthquake time earthquake time there you go all right so the the that's the that's the scene that's the scene i'm looking at more or less so all the all the buildings in fact, do in fact share this vanishing point. But the uh, the street itself does not, because the street is a hill. So these lines don't necessarily point to the vanishing point. So the rule is. Anything that's built on on the on the 90, so to speak, that is anything that's square to the subject matter. You, you know what I mean by square, right? Built on 90 degrees, blocked. The building I'm standing right next to here is um, is a very fascinating building. Um, actually, there's a few buildings down the street that have some interesting architecture. Um, yeah, let me turn you around again, just just for fun, real quick, um, to show you. I'm standing outside the Hibernian restaurant. As you know, that if you know Hibernian, that means uh, Irish food, good restaurant. Nancy and I have eaten here several times. And, and it's got fascinating architecture, as you just saw. But I, I can't, this, this is the, that building. I want to do a painting of the street, not just that building. It's really from a business point of view, it's very risky to go out and do a painting of a building, unless it's like a nationally or internationally famous. You know, sure, go ahead, paint Taj Mahal, <laughs> Eiffel Tower, <laughs> you got the idea. But if you're just painting a, a, a beautiful um, Victorian cottage, say, well, good luck selling it because the, the, the one person who is most likely to be interested is the owner. <laughs> and I've had precious little success, very little success, um, selling portraits of houses to the owner of the house. Very little success. Uh, same thing with, with buildings, uh, you know, public whatever on the on main street so to speak building all right i'm finally getting my monitor back up hello susan and cell illustra oh boy in Sp spanish or portuguese i'm sorry i'll have to look that up later and translate that. 
So I'm spraying water on all my acrylic again. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do some white stuff. White paint, that is. Normally called white paint. <laughs> if you forget the name of the stuff you're painting with. <laughs> it's called paint, Dan. It's called paint. White paint. And my music has died. Give me a minute just to see if I can get my music going again. I have yet to figure out why uh, when I'm streaming music out here in the field, so to speak, it, it so often st stops broadcasting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm using white now. I am not coloring in the lines, so to speak, that I drew a little while ago. I'm actually using uh, my white paint to, again, make corrections, to redraw what I drew earlier. And I, I can always kind of imagine somebody say, asking me, well, why didn't you get it right the first time? <laughs> I guess... I guess anybody who says that, is it fair to say if they're not... Either they're not an artist, or they are, in fact, such a freaking genius that they don't live on the same planet I live on. And, and the fact is, I, 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 I have to uh, uncover, if I can use that, that language, I, I uncover a subject matter little by little, degree by degree, step by step. And in fact, that is, I know from historical research, that is, exactly how most painters through history have done it as well. In fact, that's one of the reasons in, in uh, David Hawking's blockbuster book, David Hawking, probably about 15 years ago now, wrote a, wrote a book that just rocked the art world in which he proved, and quite, quite conclusively by the way, every once in a while you can, you can find a, a detractor, somebody arguing against his thesis and I, I've I've read I've read both the the detractors the arguers against and um, honestly I, I don't feel like I have any reason to defend David Hawking or his thesis but all the de all the people that say nah that's not right <laughs> they, they just don't know his evidence is in my opinion is, is just incontrovertible. That most of the old great masters, now there's some that we know for sure, like, oh, not Jan Vermeer, I forget. This, so I'm thinking of, uh, you know, uh, the, some of the street cityscapes, uh, Dutch, 15th, 16th century cityscapes, painting of Ghent, G-H-E-N-T, and so on and so forth. Um, It, it, it is a matter of record. We've known for, for centuries that they used camera obscura. But David Hawking's thesis is that many, 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 many of, of the great paintings that we know uh, were done with mechanical aids, most typically the camera obscura. Uh, and the one great exception to that is Rembrandt. If you listen to me for very long, you know that I have a rather high opinion of Rembrandt. And if you know anything, <laughs> I, by the way, hang on here, I have to take a, the sun has just come out and uh, I want to catch this, capture this moment. So this is what I do. When you're painting on plein air, French for in the open. When you're painting on plein air, the light is constantly shifting. Correct? Correct. Um, so you have a few, several options before you. 
The one thing you do not want to do is what I call chase the light. That is, as the light moves, you adjust your painting. <laughs> That's what beginners do. And uh, they, they learn very quickly, oh, that doesn't work, because you end up with a, a hodgepodge painting. Um, one solution is to do your painting so quickly that the life do light doesn't have time to move. So that's why many times plein air painters will do paintings this big. Again, like James Gurney, a little gouache, four by six inches, something like that. That's absolutely valid strategy. So in fact, and for many of those people, their, their plein air paintings are simply uh, thumbnail rough sketches for bigger studio paintings. Um, so option number one, paint small and fast. Option number two, do what uh, Monet did. Take a whole stack of canvases out there with you, 10 or 12 or 15 canvases. You paint on each canvas for 15 or 20 minutes, then you put it down, that's canvas number one. You pick up number two, 20 minutes, put it down, canvas number three. And then you come back the next day, if the weather is the same, the sun is the same, and, you've, and you um, file through those same dozen uh, canvases um, again and day three likewise and day four and day five and so on and so forth so by the time you're done Monet had 15 paintings of water lilies each one at a different stage of the day that's a solution boy that's 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 pretty serious there um, option number three are you ready option number one paint really fast option number two paint 15, 10 or 15 paintings. Option number three, um, take a camera <laughs> and when you first show up, when you're first setting up, you look at your scene. Once you've picked your scene, you go, I believe what I'm looking at right now is the best this is going to look, say all day or all evening. So you click, 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 and click, and click, and click. No sound effects if you're using a phone. And you take a bunch of a bunch of pictures and then from then on you work from your photograph. Does that make sense? Option number four. Option number one, paint fast. Option number two, paint 20 paintings. Option number three, shoot picture when you get there and go from the picture. Option number four, guess, predict what the light's going to look like in one, two, three, four hours, however long you're going to be out there, and, and start painting in that direction and then if you're still out there in two, three, four hours, hope that you're correct and make little adjustments. That is the one that I do most of the time. Now there's some real simple reasons for that. That's the fourth option is predict lighting, paint in that direction, and then make corrections as you know, time will tell whether your guesses are correct or not. So in order to do that, you have to have some, some degree of savvy about um, what you know play of light right so you that won't work so well if you're a beginner that that works well if you're really familiar with what light does to things because right now the scene i'm looking at for instance let me turn that turn you that way again just for a minute right now that scene is dreadfully boring that is called bad lighting okay um which brings up another subject i'll try to remember to get this what do you do if it's just a cloudy day what do you do if you travel three, four, five hours in order to do a plein air painting, either in a big city or on a mountainside, and you get there and there's no sun, there's a cloudy, bad cloudy day. That's another subject, I'll get to that in a minute. Let's go back to the fourth option, which is the one I do the most. The reason is because everybody knows the golden hour. It's like an hour and a half after sunrise, hour and a half before sunset, when the sun, when the sun is either way in the east or way in the west. Make sense? Very, we don't want to paint usually, usually, every rule can be broken, we don't want to paint when the sun's here. We want to paint when the sun's here or here. Um, I'm not a morning person, <laughs> so I'm not a great lover of sunrise paintings. So I'm way, way, way more, I've done them, believe me, I've done my share. Uh, it is my job after all. But I'm way more likely, like today, to paint an evening painting which means I get here at four in the afternoon and I'm guessing what the sun's going to look like at seven. That's what I'm doing right now. now. It turns out it's become overcast. It's been sunny all day till I got here. 
But just a few minutes ago, you saw the sun did come out. So what did I do? I grabbed my backup phone, my camera, and took pictures. So now I do have, actually I already had one, but now I've got two good lighting. And, and I'm gonna be out here way past dark. Now, again, you're watching Dan Nelson. I have my own idiosyncrasies. I paint way larger than the average uh, plein air painter, okay? If you're, be if you're a beginner at this business of plein air painting, you might not realize that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like to say, the day, the day that they explained, they, you know, the proverbial they, along the lines of the day they handed out talent kind of, kind of day, the day they explained that um, plein air paintings are supposed to be small, I was absent that day. I just, I was completely, completely missed that day. So I missed the memo. And so when I started seriously plein air painting um, 15 years ago, I came, I came out of the chute uh, doing 36 by 48 and so forth paintings because I, I just I didn't know you're supposed to paint really small that, that's really true I didn't know that most plein air painters uh, paint teeny weeny 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 <laughs> you have to say it in that tone of voice too or it does not count okay I didn't know that most people painted teeny weeny 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 <laughs> uh, and by the time I learned it was too late my, my twig was already bent um, I enjoyed painting large, and and I do, to this very day, enjoy painting large. So that's that's this. What you're seeing here is not at all typical uh, plein air painting. In fact, you could you know so you would have good reason to uh, question uh, whether this is plein air painting or or not. It is, technically. In fact, it is in the... I'm, I'm much more like uh, Claude Monet than most of my contemporaries. The last time, the last time that I won a plein air painting competition, which, alas, has been a year and a half or so. I haven't entered many competitions. Only one since then. No, not at all. Please do. So I'm talking to I'm talking to you two, but oh, you're in, oh, either that or I'm just schizophrenic, and I I put this stuff up so so you know so people can't tell I'm crazy. Um, the last time I, I won uh, uh, a plein air competition, I did the, the painting that won was 30 by 40 inches, and and the um, the judge rightly um, questioned some of the local organizer and said did, did he really do that you know because everybody else is doing you know this big and I'm doing this big so anyway I'm, I'm just trying to be educate you guys and say what you see me doing is not very conventional at all I'm going back to white now but you know what I am I'm in trouble I really am running out of white let's hope yes good I see some white in there pardon me while I climb into my van I know I'm supposed to have backup, but you know, supposed to and actually having it sometimes can be can be very different things. Um, what else? Oh, oh, I know. I was going to talk about um, what do you do if if you go out to do plein air painting, like is happening to me tonight, actually. Um, and and uh, the weather was sunny it was sunny all day today beautiful beautiful sunny tending toward a hot and uh, 91 degrees something like that i got down here at about 3 30 and it started clouding up nearly immediately almost immediately <laughs> two things first of all if you're painting this big and if you don't have all this equipment so as you can imagine it takes me about you know five times longer to set up than it does the, the average plein air painter. Not the least of which is because I bring you guys along and, and all, my, all my equipment. <laughs> um, uh, 
So option number one is pack up and go home, especially if you paint itty bitty like, you know, like all those wimpy. <laughs> Do you hear a slight, slight, slight edge of contempt in my voice? Nah. <laughs> it's just slight, slight, so slight that n nobody would notice. <clears throat> Um, contempt for the the the, the, the itty bitty bitty little plain air painters. <laughs> Me and Claude, we're like this. <laughs> Monet. Um, option number one is pack up and go home. Come back another day. A couple years ago, um, I I had one day to to paint uh, in Washington D.C. That was all. I, I couldn't come back the next day. Uh, I had business in DC, and it, and and the the only way to make it worth my trip, worth my while, was to paint the town, so to speak, while while I was there. So I, I got all set up. In fact, you can watch this. Uh, you can watch this video. It's it's available on YouTube. It's one of my rare highly produced edited videos. It's called Painting DC. So if you just on my channel there, if you want to see it, uh, 90 minutes of uh, a highly um, narrated, so I, I, it's heavy teaching. I mean, you know, real, real step by step. Not enough people have seen it, which, it, which is a waste because it's, it's a really good video. Anyway, you can see what I did. And I talk about this on that video I talk about so what do you do when you get someplace and in this case I had driven you know five hours to get to uh, Washington DC and it was cloudy all right so here's the answer to that question you have basically two options one is you can pretend that it's sunny <laughs> don't laugh <laughs> that's that's a that's a real option you can pretend that it's sunny and paint a sunny day in, on a cloudy day. Okay, now that obviously that means you're going to do a lot of inventing. Inventing of light, inventing of shadows, inventing of light effects. And once again, that is not for the beginner. Uh, but if you're a pretty good painter, you can do that. Option number two, if you go up, go up plain air painting, and going home, packing up is not an option. Option number two then is, um, so it's a cloudy day. Option number two is uh, exaggerate the atmosphere. And that's basically what I did on that uh, painting DC video that I'm talking about. So in that case, you paint Moody, rainy, foggy, cloudy, a foggy day in London town, right? Sorry for the bad singing, but you know. <laughs> um, so that's option number two. Now let me, let me go back to option number one again just for a minute. Um, if in fact you want to do the, the invent sun, can be done. It's like doing figure drawing without a figure, right? I mean, you better, if you want to be a good artist, you, you sure, sure as heck have to learn how to paint a human figure without looking at a human figure. So that when you do look at a human figure, you're just looking at specifics, details, idiosyncrasies, and so forth. Anyway, that's, that's another topic. But the same thing is true with sunlight. Um, yeah, you, you, you should learn how to paint... Uh, as if the sun was shining, even when it's not. All right. And I was going to give one, I've, I've said this before, just real quick, real quick lesson. Um, generally speaking, on average, the difference between the sunny side of a building and the shady side of a building, all things being equal, which of course many times all things are not equal, but all things being equal, <laughs> The difference between the sunny side of a building and the shady side is five degrees of separation on a 10 degree grayscale. Okay, now 10 degree grayscale is the standard, either in photography or in, in art, either one. One end of the scale is black, the other end of the scale is white, and 10, actually in my case 11, because I do 10 shades plus white. 
Um, be that as it may, uh -huh. the, the difference between a shady and a sunny side of a building is five degrees on a 10 degree grayscale. Now, if you wonder what that means, don't leave my video right now, but when you do, <laughs> go to Google, type in grayscale, hit image, you get hundreds of grayscales, and almost all of them are zero to 10. And look from three to eight, from two to seven, from four to nine, five to 10, zero to five, and so on. That's, that's the difference between the dark and the light side of a building. And I mention that because, in fact, that's one of the biggest mistakes that uh, student uh, landscape painters, one of the biggest mistakes they make is inadequate uh, sun shadow contrast because they didn't hear this broadcast. <laughs> And so they don't, they, they do the shade way too light and the sun, no, yeah, and the sun way too dark. Or at least one of those. Most typically, they do shade way too light. Okay, just if you want to know. So there you go. Whew, there's a lot of heavy teaching on plein air painting. When you get there, plein air painting, you have four options. You like what you see when you first show up, you take pictures. Number two, you do 15 paintings, what stages, over day after day after day. Number three, you paint really small and fast. I'm not sure this is in the same order. Or number four, you predict what the light is gonna be. That's what I'm doing here. All right, I'm gonna, while that white stuff is drying, let's do some drawing. Uh, this, this street, oh, and where's my vanishing point? I think it's right there. I'm going to put a circle around it. Uh, this street is very, very typical of, of, of a city street in, in the modern world. Uh, this, along the, the curb and along the sidewalk um, is a veritable forest of vertical lines. Let me, let me Point you, let me do this again just so you can see. Whoa, by the way, the sun's coming out. Hang on, hang on. Let's grab the camera time again. Grab the camera, grab the camera. Come on, come on, come on. The sun just came out, so see, so it's been 30 minutes since the last time it came out, which means the sun is at a lower angle this time. And I don't know which of these pictures, so I've taken three decent pictures now. See, the sun just came out. I don't know which one of these is going to be the, the beauty shot. I'm going to take another one right now. Then I, I need to talk to you guys about the uh, camera app that I'm using. This is very important. Um, again, this is a, a backup uh, phone, you know, an old phone. Uh, when I went to trade in my phone uh, a couple years ago now. Whoa, whoa. This battery's getting low and it's been plugged in the whole time. Oh, on it. Ruh -roh. Okay, glad I caught that. I, I, pardon me, I have to walk, walk away from you. Uh, one of my battery packs is um, empty. Wow, I, I I have about seven of them typically with me, and I'm pretty careful to keep them all charged up. Somehow that one slipped through the cracks. Whew. All right, so I, I'm sorry. Interruptions to my interruptions. So I just took a picture. Um, let me turn you around back toward me again. I know how much you love me. <laughs> um. And let me show you uh, this app. Um, it is called um, Pro HDR. Now, I don't know if you can see this. It's this icon, second from the right. See the dark one? That one right there. It's called, um, it just disappeared on me. <laughs> it's called Pro HDR. High density, I forget, forgive me, forgive me. Somebody can tell, somebody leave a chat, tell me HDR, what it stands for. Let me give you a real important warning. Uh, you iPhone people, and us droid people too now, um, you might, you are saying to me, oh, 
my phone has that built in. The answer it does not. Very clever marketing crap. <laughs> Irritates me. No, it does not. It has an artificial HDR, yeah. fake HDR, and the fake HDR doesn't hold a candle to the real thing. So, yes, you're gonna have to pay the big bucks, three dollars, I think, maybe two, for a Pro HDR. Here's what it does. It takes, and that's why you have to hold it still for so long. It takes one picture, underexposed. One picture, middle meter. Third picture, overexposed. And then it, in the computer, it puts those three images together, making the light areas dark and the dark areas light. Now it can sometimes get really funky, so it's not a, it's not a brainless cure-all, but it's a great, great advantage uh, for, if you're an artist and you paint outdoors, you need to buy Pro HDR. They should be sending money, shouldn't they? Um, And again, the, what's on your camera, the, it's called HDR, but it's not real. And the reason you know it's not real is because you pick up, set it on HDR, you take it, and it takes a picture in one second. Proof that it's not HDR. Because if it was HDR, it would take uh, four, five, six seconds uh, to, take, to take that picture, and uh, it doesn't. So it's, it's, not a real pro, it's not a real HDR. Anyway, HDR takes the, oh, the thing I was going to show you a while ago, let me do that again. The sun came out and interrupted me. I just wanted to show you, uh, you can't see it very well. Let me hang on, let me give you another earthquake ride. I wanted you to see the veritable forest of vertical shapes. I don't know if you can see way down the, way down the street there. Hello, somebody, yes, you may, Redina Blog, Blugs. Redina Blugs, hello. Can I, yes, absolutely, you make, make a bid on the painting. Please do. Thanks for mentioning that to me because anybody may make a bid. Uh, feel free if you just want to play the game. And in fact, I, I tell people this. If you just want to play, I, I, I do solemnly swear. <laughs> it's not, isn't that a motion for solemnly swearing? I do, <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I do solemnly swear that if you... If you bid less than five hundred dollars you will not have the painting but if you want to just have fun and and place a bid of uh one two three four hundred or even five hundred dollars um just for fun say i bid on dan Nelson painting um go ahead knock yourself out um you will i will not let you have the painting and if you you're saying well then what is the reserve price and i'm going i'm not exactly sure um let me think about it for a minute uh, um, I should be able to answer that question, really. At least 700, probably 750, probably 800. Okay, so there you go. So yeah, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that to discourage you from bidding. I just want to give you a, re a realistic parameters there. Cars, cars, cars. Are you pointing the right direction? Yeah, but we can zoom in a little more. Can't we? There we go. You guys doing okay? I am completely ignoring all of your chat. Sorry about that. I'm just I'm working too hard. <laughs> Poor me. Poor Dan. He's working too hard. <laughs> Before I started. Um, Broadcasting this evening. I, some of you were here. I, I told you we got uh, rain threatening, so um, I had to take a a long break and and took a bathroom break. Too much information, I know, but you know. And uh, and it was in the restroom, and a couple guys were in there changing their clothes. They were obviously employees of this fine establishment. And uh, we were joking about, you know, working for a living, just, just working. And, uh, you know, when, when, most of the time when people say, no, I'm not, I am, believe me, I am not complaining. I am blessed beyond something, something to be able to uh, make, make a living through my art. Believe me, I, I'm very, very blessed and I know that. But at the same time, some of you know, 
to use the vernacular, I work my buns off. That's why I don't have any buns. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. I'm not going to show you right now. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm kidding. Um, good grief. I just drew those up there, and now I'm moving them already. Oh, they're farther apart than I drew them, but it's better. So this one's right. That one's wrong right there. I don't know if you can even see the lines that I'm making. Um, yeah, I work, and I was joking about, especially, you know, I sort of feel obligated, honestly, when, when I'm talking to real workers, you know, people that are waiting on tables and, and being chefs and all that, it's a restaurant. Whew, my, my impression of restaurant workers, I mean, do I hear, do I hear an amen, anybody? Restaurant workers work hard. I actually wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even compare what I do to what restaurants workers do. I, mean, I just have immense respect for all of you guys that, that work. Anyway, we, I, we were in there talking and I, I feel a little bit sensitive because I think they think I'm a rich, you know, rich white guy. And of course, here I am dressed up with a bow tie and suspenders trying to, in fact, increase the illusion. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I, I, just, I think it's just kind of fun to be a little spiffy when you're an artist and then it's just for fun but anyway we were talking about working and uh, I, I know that people when they see an artist they think oh, he's got a cushy job some of you my regular followers go oh yeah no he works really hard probably not as hard as a restaurant worker but still pretty hard anyway and I was making that old joke you know people ask me all the time what's your inspiration <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> that is a nasty, arrogant, arrogant, <laughs> smart aleck. Okay. Well, a better, stronger word would be more appropriate. It's a smart aleck laugh. Um, that question, what is your inspiration, is such a, such a 20th century, stupid 20th century art phenomenon. For centuries, for freaking millennia. Artists did work because it was their job. Their inspiration was food on the table. Only in the last hundred years. That's amazing. Can okay. I be on your video? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, stay here. I'll turn you. There, there. Wait. This is absolutely amazing. <laughs> I love you guys. This guy is amazing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, man. You're welcome. Okay. God bless you. Bye. Thank you. Love it. Later. Thank you, man. Bye. Bye. <laughs> love it. Thank you. <laughs> I drowned 121. Oh, it's passers by, passing by. That's what's going on. Uh, what was I talking about? Um, oh, yeah, about when you ask an artist, what is your inspiration? I, 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 I feel so strongly about this. I, I really want to use naughty words. <laughs> so I won't. You guys fill in your own naughty words. That is such a mm -mm 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 -mm. 20th century poppycock. Now, I don't, I don't blame anybody because all their, all their whole entire educational life, they've been taught, you know, that art is, that are supposed to be, it's about inspiration and other crap like that. But, um, I am an artist in the, in, I, I'd like to think I'm more in line with uh, all of the great artists before the 20th century and some of the 20th century artists but i don't sit around and wait for inspiration my so my answer you've heard this joke sem, sem, true joke before what is my inspiration the answer is my mortgage man my mortgage and now that now that i have naughty words in my head <laughs> i want to say it's my effing mortgage <laughs> just so you kind of get the point you know what i mean <laughs> that's my that is my hope my mom's not watching tonight that is my inspiration. <laughs> I'll go this far. Damn, I got a mortgage to pay. That's my inspiration. Now I really hope my mom's not watching. Anyway, I'm quoting other people. You understand why I use that kind of language. <laughs> I would never speak that way myself. Mom. <laughs> All right. Um... Hey, while I'm while I'm stopped and drawing stuff, let's just do some more. Um,
Yeah, good enough. Good enough. No, not good enough. Let me do something. There we go. All right, good enough. <laughs> um, time to spray my paints again. Then let me let me take a break after I after I spray all these. I I should use a larger sprayer, but the larger spray bottle wouldn't fit in my um, easel. Does that, does that make sense to you? I've got this small one because it fits right in this tray. All right. I've been going for hours now without looking at what you guys are saying, so let's take a minute and see what you're saying. Early on, Susan Zarin was with us. Hi, Susan. I don't know if you're still there or not. Probably not. She got bored or died of laughter or boredom, one or the other. <laughs> Portuguese. All right, Brazilian Portuguese. I love Brazil. And... Uh, Cell Illustra says, I have to go now, but I'll come back later to see what you've done. You're amazing. Thank you for sharing. You are very welcome. And I love your country. I've been there. Um, I love your country part, partly because the two favorite instruments when I was down there this many years ago in Maranhão, São Luís, way up in the, you know, on the sticks, um, was the, the uh, piston, the trumpet, and the classical guitar. And those are my two main instruments. So, man, I was like a rock star in Brazil. <laughs> and there's a friend from the Philippines. It's good to have you. Yes, and the sun came out for a minute, and I shot it, didn't I? Um, my time, 6.02 a.m. in the Philippines. That's hilarious. Wow. So we must be just about 12 hours apart. It is now 6.35 approximately here in the United States. Hi, Michael McEwen. Good to have you on, on board again. Yes, I'm taking online bids. Radina Blugs says, I tried to sign up for your coaching, but I would but it would only accept US addresses. Really? Thank you for telling me that. Um, one of the students I coached was from the Netherlands and he was in so I I'll look into that. Thank you for letting me know, Radina. Radina, one thousand Canadian. Are you serious? Put a dollar in front of that. Well, and I know what Canadian means. Yes, that would be acceptable bid. Put a dollar. Wait until you see if it's a good painting, okay? <laughs> Redina is bidding and laughing. That's good. Are you drinking? <laughs> bidding and laughing. <laughs> and Moon Villabos says, hey, hey, hey. Vill oh, Villa Lobos <laughs> says, hey, hey, hey. Nice stuff. Thank you, Moon. And, um... <laughs> And she says, she repeats it, 1,000 Canadian. It is still in the acrylic stage. Uh, thank you, Radina. So there you go. We'll, we'll calculate what Canadian means for the rest of you. Um, but thank you. I'll take a break here in a little while and calculate what that means. Thank you, Radina. By the way, um, at this stage, I appreciate you making a bid. I do. Uh, I won't hold you to it. We'll wait until the painting. Let's make sure it's a really good painting. Does that make sense? So that's on my end. If, if, if I get done, I go, nah, it's not worth that, then I won't sell it to you. But usually it is. Usually it, it ends up as a good painting. So chances are good. Thank you, Rudina. I appreciate that. And we can work out shipping. I'd be glad to drive it to you. <laughs> I was born in Canada. I was born in Canada. Will not accept Canada. That is strange. I am so sorry. I'm very glad to know that. Thank you for alerting me to that. That is very strange. Wow. Thank you. Wait, thank you. Again, thank you for letting me know that. All right. So what I'm going to do now is, again, draw this uh, scene. going to be a car up close over here. It's going to be about one of my famous uh, camouflage cars. More because it's too close. It's so big, it, it would draw way too much attention to itself if I painted it in, in contrasty colors. So I won't paint it in contrasty colors. 
I will paint it in the same colors as the background. Okay. Okay, there's a sign. Oh, and there's a tree. Here, here we are back to this, this, uh, the, the downtown streets, the sidewalks, uh, I like to say it, are a veritable forest of um, vertical shapes, right? There's just a plethora of trees, signs, 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 umbrella stands, um, street lights, just there are hundreds of verticals, literally, as, I, as I, my eye passes uh, down the, the street here to my left. So now, I, yes, I am still, someone asked, I, I, I don't know if you caught my answer, yes, I'm still in acrylics. Uh, and I am now doing, um, I don't know what, what, what layer, roughly the seventh or eighth layer, I, I would guess, of this painting. And this particular layer is, and I, I don't all, always do them in the same order, of course. Um, it's, it's more spontaneous than that. Um, but this is dark details, uh, very much needed, very much needed um, at this point. Uh, I, need, I need dark details uh, in acrylics. Um, I always finish uh, the acrylic stage with, with white, so it's conceivable that um, uh, that my next layer could be white and um, and then we go to oils but it's also conceivable that I'll I'll do at least two more uh, layers So some of you um, need to sort of pay attention to the whole the whole concept of looseness, right? So I'm, I'm modeling that for you pretty well at the moment. Uh, the two-handed thing, as you can see, has a great benefit advantage uh, when when your objective is to be loose. And I do, by the way, have some, some pretty good photographs on my backup phone. Uh, the sun has come out three times. It looks, right now, Alan, honestly, it looks like that might be the end of the sun for the day. Um, but thankfully, I did get uh, some good shots. Uh, by the way, that, that's another good uh, teaching point. Let me, let me camp on that for just a minute. Um, plain air painting and bad weather. That's the, top, that's the, the name of this lecture. <laughs> this tirade that I'm about to go on. <laughs> Duck. <laughs> uh, plain air painting and bad weather. It, it, it is a... It is a delicate nip and tuck game of dodgeball, uh, plain air painting and, and bad weather. Uh, and by the worst, by the way, the worst weather is not rain. In fact, generally speaking, um, maybe not for you Canadians, <laughs> but generally speaking, the, the worst weather hazard, um, I would say by a significant degree, is actually wind. Um, you know, when, when rain happens, first of all, you usually get a little warning. You know, you see, you hear, you see, hear, smell it coming. And if you have a phone with a radar on it, you know, you have, you have some warning. So you have time usually to, to get prepared. Um, and, and I have an, one umbrella over me. I, I have room f holders for, yes, two more umbrellas <laughs> on this easel. And, uh, and, and if the winds are that bad, like if I have three umbrellas, and four, yeah, three umbrellas and this, and this canvas, 
you, you can understand, you should be saying, golly, that'd be like a sailboat. And the answer is exactly right. And for that very reason, I have a 65 pound car battery that I'm actually using right now uh, to hold the, my, my controller stand uh, down. Um, uh, so where was I going? Oh, weather, that's right. So the number one hazard is wind. And, and you can always tell a beginner plain air painter, you can always, you can recognize, <laughs> this is mean, but so true. You can recognize the beginning, the beginner plain air painting from a block away <laughs> because their entire uh, easel canvas and everything is blowing toward you from a block away <laughs> or away from you, whichever the case may be. Do you, you, you catch my drift? <laughs> Do you catch my breeze? Um, so, wind, um, and uh, I, when I'm not using my 65-pound car battery, here, let me give you a little tour. It's been a long time since I gave you guys a tour of my easel. All right? So, yeah, it takes me a long time to set up. So, in this box right here is uh, our paints, um, you know, uh, brush cleaners, uh, brushes, rags, um, all kinds of, like this bucket and, and so on. And that box, when it's full, weighs about 40 pounds. And that's really important. When I'm done with these acrylics, of course, they go in that box and then the oils come out and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Um, this easel has been tricked out a great deal uh, by myself. I, I put one umbrella holder there and there are two more, one on each side. And as you can see, there's one, there's the umbrella. And there is my, my light, my battery operated light um, before LEDs were invented. So there you go. Before LEDs were invented, um, I used to, to use the car battery to operate my 12 volt uh, uh, automotive lights uh, on, my, on my easel. Um, yeah, and there's my control stand and there's the stand that you guys are usually sitting on. And here's my stool and bookmarks for one dollar. I usually do sell a, a generous handful of bookmarks on a typical evening. I haven't sold any yet tonight. Uh, that often gives me just enough money to buy a cup of coffee or a Coke or something like that. Um, in fact, I, it's getting dark enough now that I really do. You know, can you see the difference here? Oh yeah, you, it certainly makes a difference to, to you, doesn't it? Uh, let me finish this. I'm going to do a little bit of glazing. Again, those of you who uh, need to study the art of loose painting, you know, watch me. You can't paint like me, but you can indeed. You can indeed be influenced by me, and I, I hope you take advantage of watching me just to say, to say, golly, I, I didn't know we could paint that loose. <laughs> by the way, the, the, the real reason that most students don't paint loose is even though they, they say they want to, is because they believe that they are supposed to paint loose. Now, this does not include, I say this all the time, this does not include you hyper-realistic people. This, this, I, that's, that's, that's a completely different subject. And as you know, I get off on that way too often, so I won't do it today. Um, but the, the real reason most uh, artists, painters say, well, I, want, I wish I was looser. They say that because they know they're supposed to say that. Um, but in my, in my opinion, um, they don't actually get loose because they're actually not thoroughly convinced. They don't understand why loose is better. That was, the, that was the big breaking point for me 15 years ago when, when some light bulbs came on and I began, just began to understand, oh, why loose is better. Once I understood that it really was better, then I went, oh, well then, heck with that. Then I got loose quite, quite instantly, as a matter of fact. Does that make sense? Once I really, once I, once it wasn't just a, so to speak, a statement of faith. <laughs> once, it, once it was no longer just a me parroting what everybody and all my professors had said, once I really understood it, 
then then I got loose and that's when I started doing crazy stuff like painting with two hands and so on and so forth okay so now that I've gone that in, far in I, I have to explain so why is loose better Man, I wish I had I wish I had paper here to do a diagram let me think for a minute uh, why is loose better okay without a diagram just using some some not, not not all of you need to hear this some of you already know this but um, I'm convinced that the greatest aesthetic pleasure that a human being can experience from a piece of two-dimensional art so I'm just talking here I'm just talking drawing and painting okay the the, the greatest pleasure generally speaking that human beings experience when witnessing two-dimensional art is a convergence of two things and I call them history and meaning meaning is realism the reason I don't use the word realism is because this principle also applies to non-objective painting but that's another story so I'll say realism and history of human movement um, and here's where I, I'd like to take a piece of charcoal, pretend it's a piece of paper here, and I take a charcoal and I go like this, boom, 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 real quickly. And if you weren't looking at me, I could hand you a piece of, in fact, you could find a piece of charcoal if you have any savvy at all, and you could reproduce my movement exactly because I left a perfectly accurate history of my movement by moving. Does that make sense? And um, that, that's another way to say loose, brush strokes and so forth whoops are we, have we are we not broadcasting no da, 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 da. All right, we're we back on. Sorry, I looked down and saw. That's why I have a monitor, because uh, I discovered that we had frozen. Sorry, bear with me just a minute. I have to restart my iPad technology. Isn't it wonderful when it works? Isn't it a pain in the butt when it doesn't? Um, so I don't think you missed too much. I tried to catch it pretty quickly. So hang on a second, let's try to get my iPad going. All right. Um, loose, why is loose better? A convergence of realism, uh, and, and this, is, this, this statement is so diametrically opposed to the prevailing hunch, artistic hunches of the 20th century. Uh, but I think that the 20th century was largely wrong. Now, I'm not against it. We had to go through it. Uh, but I believe the human race will, like the, the pendulum, has reached its, its apogee and is coming back now and will come back over the next century or two. Um, uh, human beings, say what you will, only art professors don't like similitude. Everybody else, all human beings, get a kick, like in their in their deep part of their gut, their lizard brain. They don't have to think about it. All um, human beings get a kick out of seeing something that a human being, that a fellow human being, rendered uh, beautifully. Okay, so that's why in, I'm saying, in a sense, we all like realism. Um, now the 20th century has taught many of us to dislike realism, but I think that's, I think that's an artificial constraint foisted upon us by the by the purveyors, by the the salesmen, if you will, the 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 Clement Greenbergs of, of the 20th century. I don't think it's our authentic uh, nature. It's just I, I I've watched too many children. Anyway, but it's not realism per se that that floats our boat that excites us it's a combination of realism and a history of human movement 
let me use completely different language and maybe a little bit less cerebral language. Um, the art that moves human beings the most is the art that um, the, the, the viewer himself or herself has to actively engage with the image to finish the picture. The artist does not do all the work for the viewer. The viewer has to participate and, um, to, in order for the finish the picture, to connect the dots, so to speak. It's in the best artwork, I think. Now, again, I like realism, hyper-realism, sort of. Enough, enough so that I do it occasionally just for fun. But I, I don't think that it is the, the, the be-all and end-all of, of uh, art. It is just one... Uh, what's one little offshoot of, of art and and because I think that the greatest art is the art that the viewer has to participate and that's all I'm gonna say about that I could go on for hours but I don't feel the energy to do so today so <laughs> you can breathe a sigh of relief <laughs> is he done yet my friends are saying is he done yet <laughs> yeah I'm done I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to get further down that, down that rabbit hole than, than I already did. These are all signs, you know, uh, aluminum, the, back, the backs of signs. And again, uh, the reason for including those, oh, and, and over here, I, I lost this for a while. Over here is a banner, you know, connected to the lamp post. I, I, like, I like that shape, so I often include those in my paintings. And it, it actually is realistic. It, it is here. Um, so where were we? Actually, we're just about, probably just about ready for a break time. For me, if nothing else, you guys don't need a break, maybe. No, you guys take breaks into, without telling me. I know the way this works. <laughs> All right. This is, I'm starting to like this now. Just starting, don't worry, it's not going to my head. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> that comes later. <laughs> oh, if only that were the problem, huh? <laughs> All you artists know. Usually, usually the problem is not arrogance in, in, in the art world. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> the art itself has a real, <laughs> has a real way of keeping you humble. <laughs> Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah, I get humbled on a completely regular, frequent basis. It's like, dang, I can't believe I did that stupid thing. I know better than that. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Ooh, almost sun coming out now. Man, if it comes out again, it'll be glorious. I'll grab my camera really fast. So the scene that I'm rendering, the sun is going down to our left here. Um, these are windows. We have lots of reflection in windows. Oh, you know what? And I am, I am not going uh, straight to oils from this, uh, from this layer because I have too much yet to be rendered in, in acrylics. Um, for me, it's, it's time to go to acrylics when you ready three things it's time to go to, to acrylics or your i'm sorry i'm saying it wrong forgive me forgive me let me say it again it's time to go to oils you're free to go to oils when now, this is not you but me one if you follow my technique you're free to go to oils when number one the drawing is almost perfectly correct it doesn't have to be perfect but it has to be mostly perfect that's, I know that's an oxymoron, forgive me. Okay, number one, the drawing has to be nearly correct. Number two, the values, lights and darks, have to be close to correct, nearly correct. And number three, uh, the colors need to be mostly correct. So there you go, those are my, my three uh, criteria for when it's time to go to oil. And um, I, I'm not quite there, I'm close. Uh, but uh, for instance, I want to have some people 
these are umbrellas and tables and I want people sitting at the tables uh, for some psychological pop and um, at the moment there are no people uh, at those tables so that's not a good not a good time to go to oils and then hello Hi. <laughs> I'm just I'm just doing my job thank you thank you Thank you. And uh, one thing I frequently do, I'm going to do right here, is I turn on lights in businesses. <laughs> right now, those, if there, if there are any lights on, in, I can't tell it, but I, I'm going to, you know, uh, as I like to say, to drive people crazy, I'm going to Thomas, can, Thomas Kincaid it a little bit. And, uh, Thank you, and put some um, shop windows, some nice warmth. Oh, another thing I'm going to do now, here, this is an exception. I'm mixing up, mixing up some opaque blue, see, by white and blue, and, and I'm actually going to erase. Shh, don't tell anybody. I was saying all kinds of nasty things about people who erase earlier tonight. That's right, none of them are still watching. <laughs> I'm kidding. But th so every once in a while, there is a time, every once in a while, but don't let it be your modus operandi, don't let it be your go-to. But every once in a while, it is okay to do a little bit of wiping out. And again, especially if it's, if, if it's not accompanied by that horrible, you know, self-loathing stuff. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. I am a worm and not a man or woman. <laughs> a few sky holes here. Um, if you haven't heard this before, let me, let me... Whoa, my battery is dying. Hang on here, folks. Hang on, hang on. A little technical emergency here. Let's see what this thing says. What does, how much juice does it have in it? Well, maybe not. Hang on just a second. I'll be back in a minute. I need to go get another battery pack. Uh, what was that? Oh, so, so a little bit of sky holes. Yeah, it, it's okay to erase some as long as it's not accompanied by that that self-deprecating inner talk. Oh, I'm so stupid and stuff like that. All that horrible stuff. And, and I know you guys. <laughs> no, I know you think I don't know you, but if you're an art student, I do know you. <laughs> I interface with art students on a very regular basis. Teaching lessons going to our painters, monthly painters group, judging shows, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So I hear, I hear people beating themselves up all the time. Generally speaking, that, that self putting down shtick, I'll call it that, is not, not a good, no, don't, don't live, that is not a good way to paint. It's not a good way to live, okay? Uh, okay, so you didn't come here for psychological counseling so I'll, I'll leave it at that Okay, without pausing, let's go right ahead to painting some figures. Oh, and I need to have some people walking on the street too, don't I? Yeah. Some of you might have heard me tell this story before. It was about 10 years ago now. I was uh, painting in Manhattan for a week. I loved it. I'm really, really ready to go back. I'd love to do it again. Um, one day in particular, I was uh, in... Uh, 
Columbus Circle, the, painting the USS Maine Memorial. Nice big glorious stone thing with bronze horses, I think. I think they were bronze. And um, spent really all day doing this painting. And um, only after I got home, I think all the way home to North Carolina, and picked up the painting and looked at it, and I literally laughed out loud. Um, there, there was not a single human being in the painting. <laughs> now think about it, New York, right? the, 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 one of the main gates to, to uh, Central Park, and I, I'm there all day painting. And doggone it, there's, there were people in my way. They wouldn't get out of my way all day long. I, had, I was waiting for them to move and, and dodging and so on and so forth. And I painted the entire thing without, any, without a single person. <laughs> I've call, ever since then, I've, in my own mind, I've called that painting uh, an introvert's view of New York. <laughs> New York City's a really nice place if there weren't so many people. <laughs> oh, I, I, um, I have come close to making that mistake several times since, but I, I certainly have not made it on such a grand scale um, since then. <laughs> <laughs> Darn people, get out of the way. Can't you see I'm trying to do a painting here? <laughs> oh. All right, it's starting to take form. Can you tell now? I, I, I'm trying to decide. Nope, okay, I'm just going to tell myself I am not in a hurry here tonight. If I don't finish tonight, by the way, and this was my this was my attitude when I came down this evening. If I don't finish tonight, um, I I will come back and finish tomorrow. So I'm not going to force myself to stay out here till midnight. If I have the energy to do it, yay, so be it. It seems like I did that a lot more in my younger days. Uh, but if I tuck her out at 9:30 or 10, I'm I'm going home, uh, and and I'll leave myself the opportunity, the freedom to come back tomorrow. That's, of course, assuming the weather's nice. All right, I decided, though, to do uh, warm glaze, as you can see, yellow-orange, over much of this painting. Why? Because that's what this, that's what this whole street scene, what it looks like uh, when, the, when the sun comes out. It's just, it's just a wash in yellow-gold light. And now I think... Actually, I'm going to lift off just a little bit here in the shade areas. Maybe that's all. I like those runs, by the way. Um, I'm going to uh, do perhaps just one more layer of white, and then I will be finished. with acrylics. But. And, and the rule is for those of you who may be following me at all, imitating my technique, trying to do it somewhat, the rule is um, you can do wet um, acrylics. No, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm messing up. Let me Sometimes it's hard for me to paint and talk at the same time, so bear with me. You can do white on top of wet. That's, that's, that's what I am trying to say. You may. You're allowed to do wet on white. I mean, white on... <laughs> I, then I said it wrong. You're allowed to do white on wet. In other words, all this yellow gold stuff that I just did a few minutes ago, it, as you can no doubt surmise it is very wet and it's okay for me to uh, to work white into that so I'm painting like an a la prima paint like an a la prima oil painter at the moment and and um, my brushes are, are picking up the the wet orange stuff 
and creating a really delightful slurry. Do you like that word? That's a good word for it. A delightful slurry of, of uh, white and orange. Now, now, I have to give a very, very, very serious warning caveat. Um, if you, at least you want to paint like me, if you, if you want to paint well, not that I paint well, but if you want to paint like me, um, this does not mean, the fact that I'm painting uh, white into wet does not mean that I can um, rub and rub and rub and scumble and create uh, an opaque yellow-orange color. I mean, if, if, you, if you just kept rubbing, that's exactly what would happen. You would, it would be as if I uh, intentionally m mixed uh, some white and yellow-orange on my brushes and painted opaque. That's, that's legal sometimes, but that's not what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm hoping you understand that, right? If you do that, then you lose the beauty, if you will, of this, what I called the slurry a minute ago. You lose the beauty of a la prima, messy a la prima painting. And I'm saying this because I know some of you are so ticky, <laughs> obsessive, compulsive, anal, OCD, whatever, that it, that it would drive you crazy to paint uh, white into wet because, because of that what I'm now calling a slurry because of that spontaneous mixture that's happening right there on the canvas that it's, it's it doesn't feel like you're in control right and, and indeed you're not that that's the beauty of it you don't want to paint in control Woo! there's a statement for you I haven't said that one in a long time let me repeat it here that was worth repeating listen to me all you students you do not want to paint in control. And I, I, want, I want all of you students to, to gag and gasp and sputter and say, what, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What do you mean? Of course you have to paint in control. No, 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 no. So let me try to define it, describe it this way. And I've, I've described this several times over the years, but probably not since any of you are listening. Um, if in fact you, the artist, now let me let me say let me say it the other way around. If in fact, when your painting is finished, if everything on that canvas came out of your, I'll be nice, came out of your. Um, Careful, <laughs> contrived, controlled, carefully, control freak, <laughs> brain. <laughs> um, well, then that's one kind of painting, isn't it? That's a control freak painting. And in fact, there are many people in the world, all through history, that have done beautiful control freak paintings and I'd be I'd be an idiot if I didn't admit that I do admit that I've done some control freak paintings that I'm still quite fond of okay so you understand I'm I'm, I'm in the trenches with you v very rarely if ever does a control freak painting I'm gonna use weird weird psycho spiritual language here for a minute try not to freak out very rarely does such a painting reach transcendence. And I, I know some of you are, that's just going to be enough to send you off onto somebody else's channel. But those of you who are still left. Transcendence, what is it? I, I don't know, but it's something beyond. It's something that goes um, beyond what we can explain or analyze or frankly, what we yeah, beyond what we can create I, I I think that every every transcendent mark that I have ever put on a canvas and I'm happy to say that I've put a fair number of transcendent marks on a fair number of canvases not every single one of them was transcendent that's for sure if they were I would be Rembrandt and I am not there yet um and even every not every one of his marks was transcendent later life though he had a frightfully high batting average. <laughs>
Anyway, um, transcendence is more than the sum of the parts. Good art, great art, all great art defies analysis. In fact, you, you know, you, you, you guys, if you follow me often, you, you've heard me kind of rag on, I already did it tonight, rag on much of the 20th century junk, right? But, um, I believe that when you look at Picasso's Guernica, it's a transcendent piece of art. It's a transcendent experience, and mostly you have it. It defies explanation. In fact, I've wondered at times in my adult research, I have I've actually wondered if, in fact, um, Picasso became what he became. I, I, I you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't really try to defend this thesis with any great gusto, but it's, it's worth, I think it's at least worth considering. I wonder if Guernica ruined him. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm, in fact, personally, I don't, I don't think he ever reached that, that place again in his career. And I think it might have, uh, the, the ghost of Guernica might have haunted him for the rest of his life. And he was a fairly young man, late 30s, I think. I don't know if we could look it up. He was a fairly young man when he painted that. And uh, I think it's a transcendent, I think it's a truly a transcendent piece. So there you go, in spite of all the, you know, nasty things you, <laughs> you, you usually hear me saying about modern art. And, 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 and many of the greats, like I, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of Jackson Pollock, but to say that none of his pieces were transcendent is like, no, the famous ones. Yes, he punched through. Something happened there. Hey, while I'm on the subject, just for fun, just for fun, since I've already driven away all the spiritophobes. <laughs> That's a new name. I just made it up. People that get freaked out at the sound of anything remotely non-materialistic. Um, in, in, in the world of music, there are concerts and then there are concerts. And I, this is true for rock and roll, rhythm and blues, blues, classical, symphony, opera, you name it. Every night when a, when a performing group goes out on the stage, I, I believe they are all hoping that tonight's concert goes somewhere beyond where any of them could go intentionally. It's like it's a magic that happens that you can't put your finger on. And I, I believe I've seen it many times in my life. I've seen uh, one, one that comes to mind in particular is a Bruce Springsteen concert. I don't even know when it was, probably at least 10 years ago, maybe more. And uh, they're doing all their stuff, all their hits and all their normal stuff. And late in the concert, this is, I saw it on TV, so I wasn't there, I just saw it on TV, you know? There's nothing highbrow about this illustration. Late in the concert, there are all the musicians. He has surrounded by fabulous musicians. Bruce Springsteen. And I am not an aficionado of rock and roll. I'm a listener, and I have played plenty of it, but I'm not an expert. But anyway, late in the concert, they're all off book, they're all off the page, and they're all playing. And, and I, I, I watched it, and I said, you, you can't tell me that all the members of that band didn't realize that the whole concert, it, like, it got taken into the stratosphere. Nobody knows how it got there. All they knew, all they could do was enjoy it while it lasted. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. Others of you just think I'm crazy. <laughs> Which goes without saying. That's, that's, not, that's not the question. Oh, I, one of these lights has to be on, doesn't it? Should it be a green light? Yeah, I think this is a this is a green light painting. Most of the time I do red lights, but tonight this is green. Whoa, <laughs> wet brush. That was not the effect I was looking for. Anyway, so um, if you want a transcendent painting, you have to let go of control, hyper control. Now, if you let go of control, that means sometimes, and this, this really is a good 
thing to, to teach and talk about. Um, again, to, especially those of you who may be being influenced by my my school of painting, if you will. Um, when you paint in this out of control manner, um, you can crash and burn. You can sometimes smash on the rocks below. There is no question. Okay, that's part of the that's part of the risk of painting out of control is you might crash and burn and that's no fun every time it happens like ah let me but since by the way every time that that happens <laughs> every time i do a bad painting which is not that often but more often than i like um my attitude is well thank god that's done <laughs> do, you, do you catch that you know <laughs> For you theologians, I turn into a bit of a Calvinist. <laughs> Dust myself off and say, thank God that's over. <laughs> I won't explain that to the rest of you. That's all right. It's just a little inside joke. Um, I'm mixing up some um, opaque yellow right now because I just want, I want a shortcut for this, the shop windows over here again, which is quite, quite, quite fictitious. Um, if I could change one thing about our fair city, especially downtown, it would be that um, the, the merchants would leave just token lights, to token warm lights on. Um, to, to beautify our city. Maybe just a little LED inexpensive bulb inside every shop window. But warm, not blue, not one of the blue LEDs. That doesn't work. <laughs> okay, one more bit of opaque color I'm going to do. Wow, my battery is dying again. Okay, I'm going to take a break here in just a minute. Between, between the acrylic and oil, I'm going to take a break. And I'm going to try to resolve my battery issues and figure out why the things are plugged in, but they're still wearing down. So there's my green lights. Oh, and there's some green lights down here, too. There we go. And some green lights up there. All right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm now where I want to be. The drawing is pretty correct. Values are pretty correct, and values, and, and, and the colors. Let me look at some of your chats before I go. Um, yeah, lights on, but no one's home. That's exactly right. Redina. Are you a regular Redina? I don't recognize your name. You're, you're talking like you're a regular, <laughs> which I love. So you must be a, you must be a, a regular. <laughs> yes, I have my camera for hyperrealism. Exactly. Um, um, good. You didn't miss much. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Redina says, I liked it before you did that. <laughs> <laughs> or something <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> you're not under obligation if you don't like it if we both don't like it all right uncle uncle 60 says mark carter suffered from arrogance according to him in his early career <laughs> that's great i can i can imagine mark i think i've heard that podcast or that that video as well yeah that's good i like mark a lot we're so different but i like him a lot um <laughs> lights on no one's home yes i did paint the side of my van there's no question but it's not the first time it's been painted, so <laughs> thank you. I am alive, David. Welcome. Good to see you. This is fabulous, Richard Watterson says. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fabuloso. Um, um, David says perspective issues. You might be right, David, but this, this is a big hill. I'm not sure. I, I, good, I, I, I need to double check everything before I leave. The buildings are supposed to line up. So thank you, David. I will, I'll check on that when I, when I switch to oil. Appreciate that. David's my perspective cop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the right side looks further down the road, yeah. Ah, good. I look at a mirror. Good, good, good. Good idea. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you Redina all right y'all um, I'm gonna take a break I'm gonna try to get every all my all my devices plugged into power that's actually working 
and uh, you know I should probably call it this is so long let me end the episode this episode and start a new one all right thank you for company I'll be back in a little while bye bye